working with the maze game, first off, the maze went from a 10 by 10 to a 20 by 20, which is why now there's a lot more ones and zeros on here. Again, ones represent walls that the player cannot pass through. Zeros represent floor tiles that the player can wander over the top of. As part of doing that change, the cell width went from 64 down to 32, so they're a little bit smaller. So the cell width is the same size as the player artwork. So each square of player artwork, enemy artwork, pick up everything is set at 32 by 32 pixels square. Rows and columns do need to get updated to 20 by 20 for this to work, but the size of the whole project has not changed. There is now an additional artwork file, pickups.png, that has the spinning coins and animated jewels that will be the objects that we will be positioning into our maze project. So we'll have to just put them somewhere on screen as part of doing that. I uh, did modify the sprite so that the sprite can take a, we can pass in what kind of artwork we want. So remembering that our character file has the four characters on top, then the four enemies on the bottom. So if I want to choose skin, boy, girl, or bone as my artwork that I'm using, what I can do when I create a new character, I can pass in the kind that I'm working with. Now the way that that is working, and this is something that we'll use elsewhere, is we're applying in that character as an offset value. So the base one where it starts in the top left corner, our offset for x is 0. So we pass in the number 0. 0 times 32 will keep our x offset at 0. But if I pass in 3, then that allows me, so 0, 1, 2, 3, that gives me the first frame for the boy character. And then 6 will give me the girl, 9 will give me the bone skin. Now if I go back here, we can see I just passed in the word boy. I didn't pass in a number because I stored a reference to that number 0369 in these four variables. To be able to do that so that we can access these between files correctly and to designate that these are values that will not change, we use the word final in front of our variable designation. So this is a programming construct. Now one of the things that we will be doing as we continue to flesh out this game is tacking on additional programming techniques, programming methods, constructs, other things as ways of growing your code vocabulary. So when you see the word final, that means then this value can't change. If I said int skin is equal to zero, at some other point in the code, I could say skin is equal to one, two, three, and then that would not behave properly. So this, by using the word final, I'm designating that I do not want this value to change. This is its final version of it. So when I do that, I can now just pass in the word boy, so I don't have to think about, oh, go back to the artwork and figure out the number. I've determined what number I want to pass in right here. So now Sprite accepts that integer. I'm creating a constructor parameter called character, and then that character value is multiplied by 32, which allows me to designate which character is going to show up inside my game. Game state has been added in. We do have a value for score. We'll be keeping track of score here in a moment. We'll have to do some rectangle collisions. And with that, uh, we can start adding in. So here's the game state, the game state values. So we have start, play, win, lose, and reset. Now, rectangle intersect is currently commented out because the pickup doesn't have these values yet. Pickup is currently an empty class. We'll be adding content to it momentarily. So knowing that, um, this code won't work until we finish fleshing out what 
goes inside the pickup class. But the pickup class is going to be pretty much x, y width and height and a score value and then what type of artwork to show and then where to show it off the sprite sheet. So it's, it's going to be a pretty short class to take a look at here. So that will be the first step we will want to do next. So going into the pickup, the pickup is going to be a visual object much like the sprite is going to be. So what we're going to do is grab a bunch of the content that's in sprite, put that into pickup, and then delete all the stuff that we don't need. Because the objects, they don't have a VX or VY, they're not moving. They're just parked on screen, so they don't need any of this left, right, garbage, or any of that. So in the meantime, I'm going to copy everything that is in the sprite class, because I do need this display part here. So I'm skipping the final curly brace, and I'm skipping the very first line, so I'm going to copy what's in sprite, go into pickup, and I'm just going to paste in there, and then we'll go do some deletions. Now when I do that, I will see where it's now highlighting the word sprite going, whoa, yo, uh, this is wrong because it's not having the right thing, so we just need to change that to pickup. And now it's not going to freak out, and that gives us a good starting point. So we will need an x, y with height, source x, source y, current frames, rows, total frames, offsets, it's not moving, so we don't need any VX or VY. Delay and hold, we'll probably want that to control the animation speed of the artwork. Ground, we don't need that. The player, or sprite, doesn't use that anymore anyway, but um, forgot to delete it. So we will have to put a value in here. And th this now allows us to think a little bit about what um, we're going to do. When we create a pickup object, currently in the pickups we have two kinds. I have the coins and I have the gems. So if I want to designate one versus another on that, instead of designating the character, I'm going to just call this pickup type. So these are parameters that when we create a new pickup object to put on screen, we're going to designate what kind of pickup it's going to be. We also will need to designate our location X and our location Y that we will want this pickup to be placed on screen. With that, X is now going to be put at our location X, Y will be put at our location Y, and the width and height are 32, source X, source Y will probably not need to worry too much about those just yet. So we'll, we're going to be able to get rid of more and more things on here momentarily. Uh, it's not characters that are that, but if we, we're going to say zero is going to be equal to a coin. And if I pass in a 1, it's going to be equal to a gem. So we now we have our coin and our gem that we are going to be working with on here. Now, these we're not offsetting the x because these frame loops go across here. And now we can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So it is an 8 frame animation. So previously, where total frames were set at three for the characters. So if we look at the characters, the character animation loops were three frames long, the pickups are eight. So I need to now change that three, two, and eight. Now our current frame, we can always start our animations at zero, or we could have our animation start at a random frame so if I put 10 coins on screen, they're not all rotating exactly in unison, but they're all kind of rotating independently. If you want that, then instead of saying zero, 
what we need to do is to set up a random number based on the total number of frames. Now random always returns a floating point value, so it returns a float value. That float value will be between zero and whatever that top number is. We need to round it down so we get between zero and up to but not including total frames. So by using floor that rounds down so I get zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven because total frames is eight. So that's how rounding down helps me out here. So that gives me a random starting, flame, starting frame to work with on this. Now, um, so we're not offsetting anything. So I'm just going to comment that out. Eventually, the commented things that we're not using we'll delete, but for the time being, we'll just comment things out to make sure we don't get rid of something we actually wanted. And my offset Y on this, we're not going to worry too much about. What we do care about is what row we're going to land in. Because the coin is row zero, the gems are row one. And that really is kind of determining our, our offset. But when we are displaying the object on screen, then we're using that row information to determine our SX and our SY values. So um, it's just the order of these getting a little messy here, but we'll fix that in a moment. So if my pickup type is equal to zero, Because they only have two pickups, it's easy just to use zero and one, keep track of it. Where like the skins of the character where we had four, keeping track of four gets to be a little bit harder, and that's why we need to um, worry about that a little bit differently. So we're going to set our row equal to zero if our pickup type is zero, else. Now we know that we only have two pickup types, so we don't have to do an else if. We can just do an else. And now on this one, our row is going to be equal to one. Now I want my coins to be worth a different amount than my gems. So because I want these to have differing values, I want to have a score value that I'm able to assign to each one of these. So then when the player collides with one of these pickup objects, I want it to then assign an appropriate score. But currently we don't have a value or a variable to hold that information. So we can add that in now. And I'm not going to use the word score for it. I could use value, but value is often a reserved word in programming languages, so we probably don't want to use that as our variable name. So coins are zero. So if my pickup type is zero, then my score value is going to be equal to, we'll just say five. But if I pick up a gem, I want my score value to be equal to 20. So we've designated the row, we've designated the score value to go with each one. So we are not going to designate the row here any longer. And now SX and SY, I'm going to move those down here. So my source X is still going to stay at zero, but my source Y is going to be my row times the height. So the source Y is going to be which row I'm in, zero or one, multiplied by the height of the object. And that will allow me if Knowing that each row is 32 pixels high, if my row is now 1, that drops me down into the gem row down here. If my row value is 0, 0 times height is still 0, so that keeps me in the coins. So that now is setting up what I need. Um, actually, we'll just get rid of that stuff now just 
to clean it up. So we've passed in the kind of object, the location we want it to start. Using the type of object we pass in, we determine which row we're going to use and a score value to be associated with it. Now technically because it is 0 and 1 for the rows, that corresponds to the type of objects I'm passing in. I'll pass in a 0 or a 1 value. I could have just simply, instead of using row here, just assigned it as my um, pickup type value times the height. But I like having that row so it helps me remember when I look at the code a month from now or six months from now, it's easier to dissect the code and follow the logic of what is happening. So that takes care of the constructor. Now the nice part is the coins don't update, so I'm going to get rid of everything inside the update. So update is now empty. So this now means my uh, pickup object is getting much smaller, which is super awesome. And now when I go into display here, we're not going to display the sheet. Instead, the artwork that we're going to look at is going to be the objects file because objects is where I'm loading my pickup artwork. So in sheet is the characters, art was maze art, and objects is my pickup artwork. So we're not using sheet, so we will be using objects instead. We don't need to offset because we're not offsetting as we go, so we just have objects sx, sy with height, xy with and height. So remembering copy is what artwork we're grabbing or what image file we're grabbing pixels from. Where on that image file are we grabbing pixels? And then where do I want to display those pixels on my screen? So those are the three kind of components of working with this copy method. Now sometimes people write it so it looks like this and that can sometimes help you make visually more sense out of what's happening. What image file is being copied, where you're copying the pixels from, and where you're displaying the pixels and how big you're displaying them on screen. So if having the multiple line breaks on there helps it make sense for you, you know, feel free to do that to yours. So this now completes the pickup object for the time being. We will need to make it so that when we pick up the pickup object, it can go away. So after we collide with the pickup object, we will want that pickup object to remove itself from where we collided with it. So I am going to create one more method inside our pickup object, and this will be called hide. So void hide. And all this is going to do for now is set y equal to 0. That means when we run into the pickup, it's just going to move it up to the top of the screen. And the reason I'm doing that is so that I know it's doing something. Eventually, we would need to make it move itself off screen. And we would need a way to then reset the pickup at some point as well, so we would be able to reset the pickup. So the pickup probably will need a reset method at some point in time. Now going back into our project here, I already have a variable to store my pickup objects called pickups. So the time has come to populate that with content. So inside the setup loop here, this is where we can put it in. 
So pickups is going to be equal to new pickup. And for the time being, I think we'll just do four. Probably don't want to set this up where it's, it's not like the catcher game where we have 100 objects at a time that we're working with. Everything in this should probably be very specifically and exactly positioned where you want it on screen. So when you build your maze, you should know exactly where you are putting those objects on screen so that they are how you need them positioned within the maze. The same thing will happen when we have enemies. We will need to put them in specific places on screen. So with the pickup in place, so we'll just set our first pickup object. So pickup square bracket zero is equal to a new pickup. And now this pickup, we need to provide information to it. What kind of object? So I'm going to, in this case, I will do a gem. So I'll use one. And then I get to say where I want it to show up on screen. Now, I could just type in random numbers, but if I look here, if I realize that if I multiply, so if I wanted it to show up in a specific row, I need to then multiply my um, 32 times that particular row. So if I wanted a pickup to show up, say, right here. Then we need to, so we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So 10 times 32. So, oh, and how many down? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay, so now it's 10 times 32. 7 times 32. So I could do the math. 10 times 32, that's easy. I could type in 320. But it makes more sense to designate it by how many rows or how many columns you're moving over and just multiply it by 32. That allows you to know this is where you're putting that object. Now, that gives me pickup 0. So I have four pickups. So pickup 1 pick up two, pick up three, so zero, one, two, three. So we'll do gem, coin, gem, coin. And now I'm just going to move them over one square at a time. Actually, I'm gonna go two, so there's a little more space between them. So 10, 12, 14, 16. All in the same row they move themselves over. So that now puts the pickups on screen. Now if I haven't done it recently I should probably save what I'm doing and if I run my program nothing should have changed because we haven't told these pickup objects to display themselves on screen. That's going to be inside our main play function. So I am going to delete some of these comment lines inside the play function here just so I can fit more on screen since we have large type to make it a little bit easier. So. get rid of stuff that's there. I encourage you to leave them in yours, but this way I can just fit more on screen while we're doing the demonstration here. To loop through our pickups, so I could tell each pickup to display itself on screen, I could tell each pickup to check for a collision, or I can use a for loop. So it's the same 
kind of loop that we've used every single time we've looped through an array of objects. So again, the pickups is simply an array. In this case, I have four that I've put on screen. And with that, we can now tell our pickups i to display itself. So the same standard for a loop we've used repeatedly, anti is zero i is less than pickups dot length i plus plus, and then we tell the pickup i, which would be zero, one, two, three, to display. Now when it runs, we can see there they are, and they are currently trapped on their first frame. Now, the pickups are showing up, but they're not animating. One thing that we do need to do to build in the animation is we need to update our source x, because the source x starts out at 0. And then we want source x to update by current frame, which goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and it multiplies it by 32, or the width of our sprite. So current frame times the width of our artwork. So that's now going to update current frame. So now if I run this, we should see animating objects. And we can see that they're not animating. It show, it's hard to follow it on the gems because they are quick. But on the coins, you can see they're not perfectly in sync with each other. If you do want the in sync, I'm going to change mine temporarily to all coins just so we can see that distinction and modify the pickup. So instead of setting it to a random, we'll just say it always starts out at zero. And now it, you, you'll see all four coins are rotating perfectly in sync. If you like that style, leave it that way. If you want it to go with the random style, so that they're not all in sync, you can do it like this. With the pickups animating and showing up on screen, now it's time to collect them for points. And to do that, we need to go back into, with this, we're using our rectangle intersect which is what we looked at before in part two of the catcher game. And now I can uncomment the code inside there. So this is nothing about this change. This was copy pasted directly from the image based version of the catcher <coughs> game with rectangle intersection worked into it. So we pass the two objects in. We determine how far apart their centers are in the, both the x and y axis, as well as what is the size of half of the width and half of the height of each object. Then we do a comparison. If the distance x is less than the half widths, that means they're overlapping on the x axis. If that's true, then we check to see if they're overlapping on the y axis. If so, we return true. Otherwise, this whole function returns false. So now inside our play, this is where we are then going to go through and find out what is happening. So with this, I say if rectangle intersect, N-T-E-R-S-E-C, intersect, and now we pass in the sprite, and then the current pickup that we're working with, so pickups square brackets i. So if that rectangle intersect returns true, that means something has happened. So our score needs to go up by the value of that particular pickup that we ran into. 
and then we need to tell that pickup to hide itself. Effectively move it out of contention from being scored again. Otherwise, our, if it doesn't go away, when I intersect with it, I'm just going to keep padding my score and it's going to go up and up and up and up and up and up and that, that's just not fair. So now I can move around. If I run into the gem, the gem goes up, the coin goes up. So it just puts them up in the top square kind of where they were. But I don't have any information as to, well, what is the score? Because I'm not writing that score information on screen yet. So this is where inside our play function we need to do some work with the UI so we need to provide some of that information to the player. So to do this what we can do is simply say I'm going to choose a fill color that I know will show up, so I'll choose white. And then as I do that, I can now show that information on screen by saying text. Now the text I want to show on screen is our score. So I'll do the word score, put a space after it, close out my quotation marks, add a plus. Now I'll list my score variable and designate, well, I'll put it x over 1 square and we'll go down about 32. Not sure, we'll have to play with that y value to see if that's exactly where we want it or not. But let's find out. So when it first comes up we can see scores there. Ah, that y is down probably a little bit too far. And just so we can see if I say zero, where does that put it? And you can see zero puts it off screen. So we probably don't want to go down all the way. If I go halfway, it's probably going to give me a little better placement. Might need to go down a little bit more. Uh, the text is, I believe, 12 point text. So we can decide how far down we need to put it to get it to show up on screen, but at least we can see the score. So now if I move the player up, I hit a gem, my score went 20, it should be 25 when I hit the coin. Now 45 and 50 as I work my way over. So now we're tracking the score and collecting those pickup objects on screen. game I want to exit the maze so that means to exit the maze I want to work my way up to that square and be able to leave the maze so the condition that determines I have effectively left the maze is I want to enter this square so to do that I want to store that value of where that square is on screen so that we can set that as a goal. This allows us to introduce another uh, cool thing that we haven't played with before. And I'm going to use the P vector object, so processing vector object. Now, a vector object is useful because it stores X, Y, and or Z information. So I could set up, I could designate and so a goal X and a goal Y value using two variables, but by using a vector object it automatically has those values built into it already. So it's now just a matter of defining it how I want to put it on screen. Um, so we'll go down as we add more things, so I'm inside setup, I'll move down to the bottom of setup and say goal is going to be a new p-vector and this vector, look at my map I can see so I 
am trying to arrive at this square over here. So then that starts out, it is going to be 19 over. Remembering the first one is zero, so this is 19. And then we count down. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's going to be 19 and seven as I work my way through. With that, it's 19 times and I will multiply it by the cell width and it will be seven times my cell height. So I know that that's going to designate the square where I've just positioned the sprite player. So that's my goal object. To verify that is working, I am going to just draw it on screen right here. So I'll just set a fill color of 255. Um, so I'm doing transparent red so it sits over the top of it just so I can see. And I'll draw a rect. And now this rect, my x and y value that I'm going to choose, I will draw it at my goal x, goal y, and it's cell width, cell height. Knowing that cell width and cell height are the values that correspond to that, in this case, are 32. So if we run it, if we've done our calculations correctly, we can see now that square has been recolored. If I just want it to, I want it to be transparent. Maybe not quite that much. So I can see that it's there because I want, when I put the player into it, I want to be able to see that he's indeed in it. So that tells me that I now have that goal there. Inside our play state, so after I've displayed the character here, what I'm going to do is just, right now, just do a quick check and find out, hey, have we won? So we will check and check the distance of goal x, goal y, and then the sprites x, and the sprites y. So if the distance between the registration point of the sprite and the goal is less than 1, we'll set our game state equal to win. So now if the player enters that red box, we win the game. And we can once again check that. And win. So now the game, we can generate score, we can win. So we've created a couple of different situations that we need. Now we have to look at possibilities of losing our game. Using the same timer object that we've used before, we'll be using that again to create our timer inside the game. So adding in the timer requires us to add in a couple new variables as part of this. So we will add in some timer variables to work this out. So I'll have a timer object and I'll refer to this as my game timer. And then I will need uh, a few additional ones. I'll need well, max time, current time as part of it. And I'm going to need one other. It will be a boolean and it will be timer start counting. And the reason that we're doing this is how processing is managing our functions and loops. 
that we need to prevent some things from happening until we very specifically and explicitly need and want them to occur. So with that, we need to prevent the timer from actually starting. Otherwise, if we tell the timer to start, when we switch from the start screen to the play screen, by the time the play screen has rendered itself on screen, we've lost approximately one and a half to two seconds of displayed time. So if we say our game has 10 seconds to play, by the time it displays on screen, the timer will already be at eight, just because of how it goes through its function loop. So it's easier to, we'll have this Boolean that prevents the timer from starting until we're ready to actually see it. So we'll make it that when we go from the start screen to the actual game screen, then it's going to display a message that will say press any key to begin. And once we press a key, then the timer starts and the player can start moving around on screen. So it, it's, a, it's a hack, but it uh, will make things work the way that we need them to work. All right, so now moving down into setup, under where we've defined our goal, now we will define out our time stuff. So our game timer is going to be a new timer object, and it will run for 1,000 milliseconds or one second clicks. We'll set our max time equal to 10. Current time will be set equal to max time. Notice we have to then define those in that order. Because if we say current time is max time, then max time is 10, then we're going to get some really messed up stuff. And timer start counting. We'll start that out at false. So we're going to introduce the timer, we'll get the timer working, then we'll go through and use the, um, this Boolean to control when the timer actually starts so that we have a better result happen. Inside of our state play, our main gameplay loop, before we draw the UI on screen where we display the score and are drawing the goal, what we can do is uh, set this up so that we, if our game timer is complete, and our game state is equal to play, We'll figure out why we have to do some of these little hack things in a moment here. So if that's the case, one thing I want it to do is when the time is down to, there's only a few seconds left, in this case we'll just say five, which I know it's only half the time, but you'll probably set your max time much longer if you have a more complex setup. Right now what we have on screen is pretty minimal. So if the current time is less than five, then what we can do is we just kind of flash a redraw here. So it just flashes, I mean, it redraws red, but what it really does is it disrupts the standard smooth redraw cycle from frame to frame to frame. So we get this little like strobe effect. It doesn't do a whole overlay of a red rectangle, though I suppose we could we could do that, that actually might work, that'd be kind of fun, but this works for now. And after we've done this, then we can say current time minus minus, so it goes down by one. And now if the current time is still greater than zero, at this point, we tell the game timer to start, which is where the game timer then starts over again it like ticks off one more second on the clock so every time we tell gamer game timer to start it does another click and once it does a click then it goes until it's down to zero or 1000 milliseconds of time have passed now we can say else game timer or not game timer game state is equal to lose so if the current time is greater than zero, we tell the timer to fire off another second. Otherwise, we switch our game state to lose. 
Now, running this, oh, but well, we're not showing the time on screen, so if I wait five seconds, then we should see, now you can see the little quick flashes of red that are happening, and then we go to lose. Under our UI, we show the score. Now what we can also do is text time, and I'll say our current time, set the x, so I don't know, 32 times 4, and we'll set it at the same y value. So now we can see nine, eight, seven, six. So we can see how the time is going down. But we never saw a 10. You get the little flashes of red. So that gives the player that little bit of feedback of like, oh crap, you know, time is running out. So that's just a nice little visual eye candy. If you don't want that or don't need that, then this here, if the current time is less than five, flash the background. Just eliminate that. Take that out, you don't have to put that on screen. Or you don't need that in your code. So the way that I've elected to fix this is by using this Boolean, which is timer start counting. And we don't want any of this timer stuff to take effect unless timer start counting is true. So I can just say timer start counting, or I can do true. Both of those work. Now currently, as we look at it, now when it comes up, we'll see timers at 10. It's not running. Because I don't have any way to get timer start counting to change yet. So what I'm going to elect to do is to actually make that change when I first press a key during game state play. Now, we haven't looked at these keys for a long time, key pressed and key released, because we didn't need to, because we haven't changed anything. But what we can do is, inside this key pressed down here, we can just add in a little chunk of code so I can say if game state is play and not timer start counting or at timer start counting is false so every time we use the exclamation mark, we're saying this value is false. We use that for true and false values. So we can say if that is indeed false, so a couple curly braces, and then what we can do, I'm going to say timer start counting is equal to true. So by putting this here and flipping it when I press that, so it only needs to happen the one time. Now, I probably will want to set it up during my reset state, I will need to reset this value so that every time I reset the game, I will need to reset it. But it would be nice to provide some information to the player that that's what's happening. So inside, Going back into our main play loop here, we need to give some info to the player that that is what we are doing. So to do that, we will say else if not timer start counting, meaning it is currently false, so in that, what I want to do is do an overlay 
of translucent black. I'll draw a rectangle covering the whole screen. And then what I'm going to do is put some text on screen. So I'll just put white text on screen. So I'll fill F255. I'm going to align my text to the center. Then I'm going to specify press any key to begin. Oh. End quotes. And now I will put it at the center it on screen. It's both height and width. So it's just right in the middle of the screen. And then I will reset text align to left. If I did not do that, score and time would then be aligned on their centers as well. So anytime I do a deviation or change, it's not a bad practice to reset it. The other option is I could have that text align left inside my UI section here since I know I want those aligned to the left. So I can either reset it after I do a change or I can, every time I put text on screen, I can specify alignment, color, and size. That's not a bad practice because then you know you're, you won't get those weird surprises of text. Now when it runs, we can see I have the black overlay, the text on screen, and the moment I press a key, it goes away. So with the enemy, the enemy will use the sprite class as our basis for that once more. So if, if you want, you can copy everything from between the open and close curly braces, or just copy everything, paste it in, and then just change the word sprite to enemy. and change it in those two places. So with this we will have to go and change a, change around a couple of different things. I'm getting rid of ground because again we're not using those anymore. In the same way that we passed in a type of character for the sprite, we're, we, we will be passing in a type of character for the enemy, so we can just, I guess, leave that. We'll need a starting X, starting Y, and that, that will be enough to get us going with the whole thing, and then we will add some more parameters in as we evolve our character. So then we'll pass in starting X, starting Y. As part of it, width and height will be the same. Now our offsets as we are looking at these the offsets we have slime, bat, ghost, and spider. So I'm going to change the character designations here. We will define these elsewhere in a moment. There will be slime, bat, ghost, spider. So we know that we will be working with those. So those are the four characters that we will be passing in. So that is the type of character we'll be working with. The offset, this is where we will need an offset Y. The sprite characters have an offset of zero. And if we look at the other characters, their offset is not zero, it's zero, one, two, three, four. So 
that means instead of offset of 4 times 32, or 0 times 32, it's 4 times 32 is the offset y. So that allows us to grab characters from the bottom half of the character sprite sheet. Total number of frames will remain at 3. The current frame will be 0. The land hold will be the same. So that now gives us some options to work with on that. Now if we don't change anything here, when we dump an enemy on screen, if I press the keys that move the player, it's also going to move the enemy. That's okay for now. That's going to at least help us to see that something is working and we're getting our enemy showing up on screen. And if we look at display, nothing needs to change under display. Our updating, this stuff all remains the same. So it's really going to come down to how we want it to move itself on screen. So this update we'll be working with here in a little bit. We may want to make it so that the enemies don't move at the same rate as the player. So our VX and VY, instead of being 2 and minus 2, we might want to cut that down to say 1. Otherwise, uh, when the it's chasing, it becomes much harder for the player to run away. Unless we want it to be a fast moving one, and we could set that up as a value. So perhaps the enemies move faster than the player. So you have to be smarter about where you go. So this now gives us a beginning part for getting our characters to show up on screen. I'm going to add in other values here. So we'll do final int, and in this case, it will be slime. Slime will have a value of 0. And after slime, then looking at our sheet, we can see that it's bat. and ghost and spider so these again are similar th 0, 3, 6 and 9 so we have these four values that we'll be able to pass in when we designate the kind of um, enemy that we want to put on screen so to begin with now Instead of having enemies, well, I guess we could we'll have an array of enemies as we put those in. So this is going to be enemy, square brackets, enemies, and then we get to define that inside our setup. So it's an array called enemies populated by objects of the enemy class. So it's going to look very much like what we've done with pickups, but in this case I'm only going to do one for the time being. So I'll set our array to one. enemies is going to be a new enemy and I get to designate what kind of enemy so this is much like where the player we set past in boy this time I'll just start out with slime and we're gonna rotate through all of them to verify that all four of these do display correctly now I get to decide where I want it to show up on screen and how many cells over. I'm just going to just choose a random one right now because I don't have my maze currently handy. I guess I could scroll up. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. 0, 1, 2, 3. So then I will, I will be putting the enemy in that square right there. So this would be 3 times 32. That positions the enemy there. 
forgot to say which item in the array I was trying to do. There we go. So again, it's just like these first two lines of pickups. That's what I wanted to do here. So that now puts, that creates the enemy object. Now if I want to show the enemies on screen, so here's the sprites. I'll just put it right after sprite. Enemies dot update. Tell the enemy to update and display. Now if we run the program. We can see you can see how it's moving. But notice how the object can go through the walls. So the artwork is working on screen. It's showing up. It can I can choose from one of my four characters. That's super awesome. What I want to be able to do is designate whether the object is bound by running into the walls. And to do that, we need to check for collisions. So again, right now I have a single enemy. I would, much like pickups, I would put it into a for loop and go through the whole thing if I had multiple enemies. I'll leave that for you to deal with on your own. Now, we have the rectangle intersect, but what I need is the wall collisions. Now, if I look under wall collisions here, I can see currently wall collisions is looking for the sprite. It's not looking for the enemy. So if I want to be able to have the enemies bounce off the walls, I need to duplicate this method. And in the duplicate, and now it's telling me, hey, there's a, this is a duplicate. I'm like, well, no kidding. I'm going to say this one is for an enemy object. So we have check wall collisions for the sprite. Now we have check wall collisions for the enemy. So it's just copy, paste, and change the kind of object that I'm putting into it. Now going back into my project here, I can see where I check collisions for the sprite. Now it can check collisions for enemies. And you can see how the ghost is trying to go and it can't go through the wall either. Oh, ran out of time. Now, oh, oh, our reset's not working yet here. So we probably need to add a little bit into our reset state to reset for the timer and everything else. Uh, we'll worry about that down the road. So now the enemy is checking for our wall collisions. But I don't want all enemies to be bound by it. I want certain enemies to not be able to go through walls. But some, like the ghost, I think should be able to pass through the walls of the maze. So to do that, we're going to add a property to our object here. And it'll be a Boolean. And I'll call it Collider. By default, or no, actually not by default. I want when I designate the character, I will pass in a Boolean. And in this case, it will be with the wall. So it's, I'll pass in a true or false value. So if I say true, it's going to collide with the wall. And if I say false, then it does not collide with walls. So when I create an enemy, I said what kind of enemy, where I want it, 
and then I want whether it can collide with walls or not. And that's either a true or a false value. False means it can pass through walls. True means it will collide with walls. Let's go back up to the enemy. See, now it's telling me there's an error because my constructor is missing something. It wants that Boolean. So I will say true. So it can collide with the walls. So the way that works is if enemies collider, so if or equals true. So if it's a collider, then at that point I check wall collisions. If it's not a collider, then I don't check wall collisions. So I think, let's see, we had this as what, ghost? Probably don't want my, so let's say we'll go for the bat. So the bat can't fly through walls. Go here, and we can see how the bat is trapped. I'll run out of time. <coughs> so now it's trapped. But if I change it to a ghost and say false, and now run this, Now when I run, we'll see the ghost go walks right through walls. With the enemies on screen now, what we want is we want to modify it a little bit so that they're not just chasing or following the keyboard command. We want them to actually move on their own accord. We can use the same kind of logic that's in update where we have the left, right, up, and down. But we're going to rename those inside the enemy class so that they don't correspond to the variables that are part of the main program that they're currently using. So in order to accomplish that, we are going to create a couple new values, and it will be move left, move right, move up, move down. So instead of left, right, up, and down, we now have move left, move right, move up, and move down. To give those values, move left is equal to false, move up is equal to false, move right is equal to false, and move down is going to be equal to false. So I went in this particular order because it does correspond to the number of keys on the keyboard, or the arrow keys of, and their key code values, where it's left, up, right, down. So 38, 39, 37, 38, 39, and 40. So it just makes sense to continue that kind of sequencing of keys. So those are going to be set at false to begin with. So now what we need to do is inside of update, we need to do the chase. Now this next part here, chase is pretty much just using a distance equation, but then we have to figure out when we narrow it down, we have to uh, determine do we need to move left, right, up or down. We're always going to want to close the bigger gap first. So whatever distance is occurring between the two objects, we need to close that bigger gap first. But what I begin with is I don't want it to start chasing unless it's within 200 pixels of the sprite. So I will just check that. I'll check if the distance of the sprite x and the sprite y and then the x of this enemy and the y of that enemy is less than 200, then at that point I want to start finding out what direction I need to move. And to do that, 
we'll check and say if the absolute value of so if our distance at, on the x-axis is less than the distance on the y-axis now as I'm writing this I'm listing the sprite x and y first I could easily reverse that I just have to be consistent in what I'm doing so if I check the distance between their x's if that's less than the distance between the y's the y gap is bigger so I need to close the y gap otherwise that means I need to close the x gap do you notice I am putting in my closing curlies before I put in new stuff so I try as we end up with curlies nested inside of curlies inside of curlies it's really important to make sure you always have your closing curly so I always try and put that closing curly in before I start adding in actual code to make sure that I haven't forgotten something now what I need to do is determine do I need to move up or down based on what's bigger so if the y of my enemy is less than the sprite's y that means I need to move down so move up will be false and move down is going to be true and when I just said put in my closing curlies I totally didn't do it right there and that's what I should have done so now I can copy those and put those here and reverse it so if the sprites y, or the enemy's y is less than the sprites y it needs to move down otherwise it follows it needs to move up to get to it so that takes care of moving on the y-axis now if I need to move on the x-axis closing the x-gap it's going to be very much the same so if x is less than the sprites at x So if the x is less than the sprite's x, that means we're to the the enemy is to the left of the sprite. So that would mean move left will be false and move right will be true. Else move left is equal to true and move right is equal to false so we either if we're to the left of the object we're chasing we need to then go to the right otherwise that means we have to go to the left we don't really have options it's going to be one or the other so as I look at this so this now determines I'm either closing the y gap or closing the x gap but that is if I'm within 200 pixels of the sprite. If I'm not within 200 pixels of the sprite, I want it to stop moving. So else, so if I'm not within 200 pixels, not close, so stop moving and stop moving is setting all of those values to false so if I'm not moving move left right up and down all become false so that takes care of the chasing logic 
The next thing that we need to do is to go and change where it says left, right, up, and down here to move left, move right, move up, and move down. Now, we should be able to put that selected. I use find. Type in left. So now I can choose replace with move left and hit replace. Now find the next one replace and the next one replace next one place and that takes care of the lefts now I'll do the same thing with up right and down Now you can manually do it or you could go through and just click it. We don't have that many instances but this can be a useful way of fixing things. So using find and replace. So now we've replaced all of those. So now, theoretically, if I run this, if I get close enough, you can see how the ghost is chasing after me a little bit on the screen. Uh, so to get it to do the basic chase, um, I'm going to just modify this ever so slightly from it. So if we're doing the X, we just leave move left and not move right, or move right and not move left. Uh, we don't need that, and then we will need, so it's move up and move down. So because remember we copied this from the player or from the sprite code and we don't need it here so it it's a little simpler uh, I'm just gonna get rid of extra return so I can fit it all on screen in one chunk so move left not move right move right not move left not to all of them, then move up, not move down, move down, not move up. So now when this runs, it should start chasing after the player. And you can see currently this ghost can't pass through walls, which is pretty good. So it must have yeah, true. That's why my ghost isn't going through walls. If I want to make this brutal, so now the ghost can pass through walls. That's really going to suck once he starts chasing me because now I really can't get away. Unless I can 
Unless I can create more distance between me and the ghost. And so that if the enemy collides with us, we need another game state. So to do that, we'll just go here and say else if game state is equal to combat. And now in our combat state, it will be state combat. Now we just need to define what that function is going to be. Uh, I'll just put it between start and play so it's easy to find. You can reorder your functions into whatever order you want. You can also, if, it, if you find scrolling is getting to be really hard, what you can do is you can take code and just put it into a separate tab so it becomes a separate file so you don't have to scroll as much. So I could put this combat into a new tab if I wanted. So I could go up here, just have a new tab here and I'll just call this combat and say, oh not function, void state combat like that. And now if we just go background, we'll give it a, just a yellow background for now so that we know we've achieved it. So this is where we will define our combat. And to make the combat happen, that means our player has to collide with the enemy. So currently we have the enemy updates, enemy collides with the walls, enemy displays, and somewhere in here, perhaps before we even display the enemy, we could check to see if the enemy has collided with the player. But we don't have that happening yet, and that's going to be a simple rec <coughs> rectangle intersect, but instead of being sprite and pickup, going to just copy that. It will be sprite and enemy. Now seeing how we can use new tabs here, you may be thinking maybe I should make a tab and just put all my intersects in one tab so it cleans up my whole thing. So it's, there's no problem separating your project into multiple files if it makes it easier to manage your code so you're not scrolling through as many lines of code as you're working. So now we have a rectangle intersect available between the sprite and the enemy. So going back into the game, where we have the enemy, we'll go find, here's the enemy, for it displays. So if it's going to look just like pickup here. Rectangle intersect, sprite and the enemy we're checking right now, which in this case is just the single enemy. So if that is true, that point, game state is equal to combat. And I spelled intersect wrong, there we go. So if the enemy and the sprite intersect each other, we switch our game state over to combat, and then that is where we will figure out what's gonna happen with the combat. It'll be some version of rock, paper, scissors, but with cooler names attached to it. So now if I run this, Up here, let the ghost run into me, and we've now gone to our combat screen. 